Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Pennyworth, as well as the latest episode of Preacher. Like always, when I'm talking about something you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time when I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I say about this week's episode of Pennyworth, you can skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of Preacher. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's episode of Pennyworth. A lot of interesting things things went down into this episode. There's quite a bit to kind of unpackage. So, let's run through things. First of all, the fact is Sykes was there when Esme died, but obviously, like, I figured she had nothing to do, because, like, there's no way she'd hurt Esme, because she does love her, but the fact is she was outside. It's actually kind of adorable in a weird way. She was trying to, like, muster up the nerve to actually go talk to her, well, to go see her, but she sees that a man and woman went in, and it had a key, so she didn't, because she didn't know those were the killers, because, like, it's not like they broke in. They had a key, so so she, you know, just stayed back and she kind of feels bad. You know, she's telling all this to Peg. And I love the whole thing of like, you know, like I didn't hurt her. I loved her. And Peggy's like, oh, where have I heard that before? So I thought that was just kind of interesting. She even showed up at the funeral and everything. Obviously, the whole situation is hitting Alfred pretty hard. Like Alfred ends up kind of falling apart because of the circumstances. I even love Peggy being like, oh, poor boy, you know, you know, he, she feels so bad for him. But at the same time, you have like, uh, Sykes, you know, Bet being like, who cares? The fact of the matter is she was too good for him. He doesn't have class. You can't learn class. Am I right? And lo and behold, who does she run into? She sees Harwood. It's like, oh, Lord Harwood. And she sees him in the condition he's in and everything. It's like, it's weird because Sykes seems like she's twisted and a bit of a psychopath, but she does seem like she has some psychotic love or something. I don't know what it is. She's a strange person, and I love it. Like her being like, oh, that Harwood and that dude, Jack, who's kind of treating him like a pet or whatever. She pulls off like one of her things that has a um, point to it, stabs a dude in the eye, and like, Harwood, you're coming with us. And Peggy's like, he's not getting here. He's, he's disgusting and just filthy. And she's like, if he doesn't come, I'm staying here. So it's, it's so sweet that she's actually looking after him. It's like, oh, I guess when he was her boss, it's like, oh, you looked after me, so I'm going to return the favor for you and look after you. You know, they give him the new name Ginger because he doesn't want to be Harwood because he's like, no, Harwood was a terrible person. I don't want to be Harwood. I'm not Harwood. So they just call him Ginger. They clean him up. Uh, sometime later, we see he's got new shoes. It's like, oh, look at Ginger. It's like, ah. Oh. Like, the fact is they're taking care of them. I also love, like, the Spicers are still there. I guess that's just kind of the people, like, those are forever going to be, like, background characters when it comes to Peg and Bat, just because it's like, oh, yeah, look, you look at what they're up to and stuff. Like, the fact is they're still just walking around in their underwear, basically being servants. I mean, I guess it fits with Peggy's whole situation. Like I said, the whole diamond interest thing, which is kind of crazy, but it's just like, I'm so interested where the hell that storyline is going to go, especially him no longer being, uh, Harwood anymore, being ginger. I guess all that torture just kind of broke him and just traumatically, I guess he kind of shut down part of himself and just all that time he was living on the street too. It just kind of degraded him as a person. So I'm interested to see where they go, especially got his nose covered up now. I feel like maybe, maybe I'm full of crap. I feel, feel like I, I remember a character like that in DC, but I might be full of crap. Like, I don't know if he's supposed to be like someone like big and significant, like a someone significant in the Batman universe or not. Well, it's funny to call it Batman universe. I mean, the DC universe, but specifically related to Batman. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm full of crap. Regardless, I want to know where the hell that's going. But obviously, like I said, like, it's so interesting too because I, after Esme's death, it's been a couple months. Uh, the fact is, Alfred's kind of fallen to pieces. Um, I thought it was so interesting because uh, at the funeral, well, around the time of the funeral, before the time skip and everything, Martha and... Uh, Alfred are feeling basically the same thing. They both feel guilty because basically because they were spending time talking to each other and making out that while that was happening, Esme was being murdered. That's what he feels so guilty. That's what they both feel guilty about because even to the point that Alfred is seeing ghosts, he's seeing Spanish, which obviously he's always had dreams, but to actually just see Spanish being like, oh, if I were you and my girl was done in, I wouldn't be sat up, uh, sat up in bed. He's like, but I know who did it. You do. You know who they, he's like. Yeah, I know who they are. I know where they um where they are at. And it's like, oh, go get them then. You know, slit their fucking throats. And he's like, I've been thinking about. it. He's like, no, nah, fuck thinking, mate. Just do it. But it's like Alfred blames himself because of all that. And even at the funeral, Martha's talking to Thomas. 
this episode shows me how callous Thomas can be. The question is, is it just he's naturally callous or is it a situation where he has to play the role of someone callous? I'll get to that soon enough. But he was just kind of like, yeah, funerals are sad. It's like, oh, kind of being like, oh, the leadership's so proud of your work. It's like, dude, we're at Alfred's girlfriend, his fiance's um, funeral. And you're just like, oh, pepping me up. Oh, yeah, good work. The leadership's proud of your work. You did such good. It's like, shut up, Thomas. It's like. God, I mean, to be fair, we know some of the, you know, depending on the continuity, like, Thomas does some pretty shady shit, and, you know, Gotham and stuff like that, but still, you kind of go, like, I don't know, man, like, be, I don't know, just the callousness behind it, which is kind of like, and obviously, he's talking about, yeah, funerals are supposed to be sad, but at the same time, it's like, you, why are you, you're not sad, you're more so angry, and she blames herself, because it's like, oh, this is all my fault, because I dragged Alfred in, he wanted to stay with Esme, and wanted to protect her, but I persuaded him to go, but it's like, oh, why are you crazy, crazy, this isn't your fault, and she's like, right, I I, I don't know what I would say, is she, because she doesn't want to admit, like, what happened between them, because that would be the reasoning why she, and once again, Alfred blames himself, I just thought that was interesting. But the reason why I bring up his callousness is because we find out that he is, in fact, CIA. I figure something was up the moment he had, Like, the question then becomes, like, is Martha part of the CIA as well? I mean, because, like, the fact of the matter is Alfred had even said that. He was like, she's either the CIA. She says she's with the no-name lead, but I think she's CIA or maybe she's both. And I think the same thing kind of applies. Like, I'm sure, like, Thomas must be, like, her, like commanding officer to a certain extent maybe like or maybe their partners or whatever the case may be when it comes to the cia i have no idea but like because the fact it is like i figure something was up the moment like you know he meets with the leadership you know uh undine uh, well the leader is julian but his wife undine is there and there's a whole conversation about like oh why did you join the no mingling and he was like uh, for peace and freedom of course what other reason would there be and he's like and julian's like yeah what other reason would there be and i was like uh, they, there's something going on here. Like, the fact that you kind of almost stammered on answer. It's because he's with the CIA and he, he's talking to, um, I guess, his handler or whatever and being like, I, th I think they're on to me. They, just that conversation, it kind of gave me that feeling too, like they were aware that he was with the CIA. So part of me wonders like, because later on, Thomas comes to Martha. It seems like they haven't really been in con um, communication since the funeral. Same thing for Martha and Alfred. But, um, Thomas comes in and is like, oh, we need him for a job. And the fact is that Thomas is keeping it hush-hush what the job is. Because he makes such a point to be like, oh, murder, I'm not behind murder and stuff like that. Yet you're putting Alfred in a position where he would have to murder someone. Because the whole point is that Julian's setting up this meeting with Francis. Because and it, because the whole point is to kill Francis. Because we see that like London is kind of almost, to a certain extent, tearing itself apart. Because on a street level, we see people from the Raven Society and people from the No Name League clashing you know that little street brawl that was kind of earlier in the episode and everything so it kind of shows you kind of civil unrest in london and maybe just maybe it seems to a certain extent that's kind of what the cia wants i mean it's twisted to say but like that's kind of what the cia kind of does they kind of come in kind of like mess with other people's governments that's kind of what the cia kind of does that's what spies in general do it's not just allocated to the um CIA, but I guess, like, the CIA kind of has a bigger reputation for it, but I'm sure, like, every, like, secret government organization, I mean, secret with quotes around it, just meaning, like, what they do is kind of secretive, is what I mean, not that they themselves are secret, but... I guess because um, his handler was even like, oh, yeah, like if it comes to civil war, we'd rather back the No Name League than the Raven Society, which I'm wondering, like, why is that? Well, I guess because... They side more with what the uh, Raven Society wants. I guess it's like, I guess that, you know, because he, he was even saying like, yeah, Washington is OK with this. So I guess it's the situation that the U.S. is OK with like at the Raven Society is people that I guess we can at least uh, coincide like some of our goals and stuff like that kind of line. We could we could work things out. There'll be easier to deal. The no namely would be easier to de deal with than the Raven society. This is kind of the point I was trying to make. I think I kind of mixed up names just then, but regardless, I, I hope you get what I'm trying to say. But Alfred goes, I mean, um, Thomas goes to Martha for her to get Alfred into this, but she's like, no, 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 I don't want to do it. He's like, wait, what? I mean, she's like, I don't think Alfred's going to work with us because he doesn't like us. He's not going to work for us again. It's like, well, be persuasive because he likes you. And she's like, no, and he's like, you're so you're not going to do it. And she's like, no, I'll do it, you know. And it's just she's reluctant. 
It's so interesting because she does go to Alfred and Alfred's kind of like, no. And she doesn't fight him because she's like, I, of course you're not going. Like they can't even like she when she goes in there, like she immediately kind of looks away. She doesn't even want to look him in the face. But for her, it's like she does this. The reason why she still follows orders is because it's the only reason why she can get up. You know, I wonder if she's specifically referencing this Esme situation or is there other reasons? I think it's one of those things of like you've done enough stuff in your life that kind of keeps you not wanting to ever get up again, you know, kind of want you to just stay in bed and just crawl within yourself. I think that's kind of the point they might be kind of setting up with Martha. Now, the question becomes, is that just because of some no-name league stuff? Is it CIA stuff? Is she not, in fact, CIA? Is Thomas the only one that's CIA? Is it kind of like a double-blind situation where it's like she thinks she's with the no-name league? But even the fact that she was like, yeah, I'm with the organization that kind of pits me with who I need to be with. So that's why I'm like, she definitely, and like I said, even Alfred kind of points it out. So it's like she definitely has to be CIA. And so the fact is when she brings this to Thomas it's like well you know he was useful and she's like yes useful and he's like well I guess we just have to find someone else and I think for Martha it hits her to be like Thomas doesn't care about anyone the fact of the matter is you're just willing to go to the next person like they're nothing so that's why I'm kind of confused on where Thomas stands because it seems like he's callous but at the same time it seems like his callousness has a reason it's all for the CIA it's kind of like it kind of comes with the territory I guess but at the same time it's like is it just you being callous for the CIA or are you truly like that like I mean it almost feels like everyone is just a pawn in this game to him in the grand scheme of things because the fact is and I think even Martha probably feels like that like you just throw people away like they're nothing people are just tools to be used by you I think that's something she might kind of get that feeling for so, Thomas goes to two people he knows, uh, Baza and Dayboy. Baza doesn't want to take the job. Dayboy jumps on it. Doesn't seem like he's drinking, maybe. But I think it's a type of situation of, like, I'm being paid to kill people. It's like, hell, I've killed people for free when he was working for the military. So, I mean, plus the occasions that he's killed people over the course of this show as well. But regardless, I think for him, it's like, I did it for the queen and everything. So, eh, I can... I, I would do it, especially if you're going to pay like a crap ton of money. But, you know, once again, not telling them. Up, well, he is about to tell them, but Baza doesn't want to. He doesn't care about the details. So then all, all the while this is happening, you have your boy John Ripper showing up. And it's like, OK, what the hell is this about? He's bringing uh, Alfred along because Alfred still owes him a favor. He's like, oh, you're looking better, Alfred. He's like, actually, that was me being sarcastic, basically saying you look like shit, Alfred. Get yourself together. And then, like, Alfred's mom comes in, and she's like, oh, Mr. Ripper, I, I, I'll, I, I'll just... Yeah, because legitimately, he was running down the street. People were trying like crazy. A lady was kind of getting to her place. She was trying to rush and get in her place to get away from him. Like, people know not to be around him. People are scared of him around everywhere. But, um, yeah, he's asking Alfred to be his jogging partner. I'm like, what the hell is this all about? And then we see it kind of cut a little montage. It's like, oh, he, you know, it's like Alfred's getting more into it to the point he's running past Ripper at one point. He's like, come on, keep up, Alfie. And it's like, holy shit. And it's like, oh, the whole point was he's trying to get Alfred back into shape and everything. And it's like, what's up with that? Then they go to Esme's grave and it's like, oh, what's this about? And John's offering him. Basically, it's like, I will give you the name of someone who will give, who knows everything. They will know exactly, because Alfred was under the impression that it was a robbery, but it's like, no, like, uh, Ripper, it's like, no, it was more than that. The fact of the matter is, someone who really, really hates you did this. They've been secretly watching you squirm. Like, John doesn't know the actual name himself, but basically he's putting Alfie in a position of, hey, you work for me. I'll give you do this thing for me. I'll give you the name of someone who'll give you the name of the person who's behind all of this. So that's crazy. Um, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Like, and in the grand scheme of things, I'm like, what are you getting out of this? Like, what's going on here? Um, he goes and picks up a shotgun. He goes to try and talk to Dave about Dave Boy and Baza, and we see Baza doing drugs. Now, my question is. Did he do that? Was that recent thing? Or has Baza always been secretly doing it? Like, just like Dave Boy's got his vice of drinking, maybe Baza's always had his vice of you know, doing drugs. Like, everyone's got their thing, like, cope, way of coping. Like, we never really saw how Alfie and Baza cope. We always saw how Dave Boy coped. But, like, maybe Baza has been doing that the entire time and we've just never known. Or maybe after this recent situation with Dave Boy going off to be a hitman, it's just kind of like, maybe he partook. I don't know. But the whole thing was I found interesting is because even at the bar, he's asking Sandra and her dad being like, yo, uh, has Jack um, 
come back to town or whatever. Is it Jack? Yeah, uh, John's nephew. Asking, like, because it's like, because he started wondering, it's like, oh, he's working down the list of people who hate him. But then Sandra says something where she's like, no, of course not. Like, every, his dad, her dad was like, oh, everyone loves you. And she's like, yeah. And part of and her responding like that made me go, yeah, I might not have talked about that last episode, but you definitely got an inkling, like, the way she kind of looked at him. It's like, she's got those eyes, like, I like you type of thing. I'm like, huh. I thought that was just fascinating. I was like, is that something? It, it seems like Alfred didn't really pick up on him, but I kind of like, in this episode too, I'm like, she definitely has a thing for Alfred. He just doesn't realize it. Because she's like, oh, look at you, looking old, look at you, you know? So, when the time comes, he has to do this job for Baza at this, I mean, for um, John Ripper. And it was so interesting, the conversation, he's like, you know, of all the people that are, other dead people kind of, you know, because I know who you are, it's like, do they ever visit you? And he's like, ghost? No. Because he's like basically saying, John is saying that ghosts are a symptom of a weak person's mind. The fact of the matter is, you know, you letting like figments of your own imagination. Because it's saying ghosts aren't real, they don't exist, it's all in your head. It's just figments of a weak mind trying to plague you. But the fact is saying, like, have you seen any? And Alfred's trying to pretend like he isn't. Because he's seen Spanish twice. Because even after, I mean, to be fair, we don't know how much he saw Spanish in those months time that passed. Uh, I wonder will we see him anymore. Probably until Alfred gets his revenge, he probably is going to keep seeing Spanish. Maybe that might be the route they go about it, but nevertheless. At the same time, we have Baz, uh, I mean, God, I keep doing it, uh, Day Boy uh, at the restaurant where Julian and Undine are meeting with Francis and everything. Uh, Day Boy is not that good. I mean, to a certain extent, like the fact is he got caught. The dude's like, hey, the dude, the, the chefs in the kitchen are like, yo, I don't know you. Oh, you're a thief, aren't you? He rounds everybody up, puts them in a the freezer or fridge or storage room, whatever the case may be. Uh, they're out there talking. And it's kind of interesting hearing the conversations between Francis and Julian and Undine. Like, basically, it's like, oh, we want the same thing. It's like, we both love our country, yes, but love isn't enough. And Undine's like, I believe so. And it's like, well, then you're basically naive if you believe so. The fact of the matter is, we're all, we all, we're all here because we believe that we have the right and the, the right reasons to be in this whole fight for our country. But Francis is like, we have God on our side. And the numbers. So the fact of the matter is like saying that the no name league is on its last leg and everything. Lo and behold, Dave Boy comes out, pulls out a gun on Francis. And and he's and basically, I guess, because he feels bad about like killing guys. No issue. But he feels bad about killing a woman. So he's like, can you close your eyes, madam? He's, she's like, no, she shoots him. I'm like, oh, shit. Didn't see that coming. And then he's bleeding. He's like, oh. Uh, and she's like, all right, Dave Boy, what's your name? And he's like, Dave Boy. She's like, all right, Dave Boy, stay awake. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I know the drill. And he's like, actually, good on you, man, because, you know, what you just did, most people have been trying to and have it successfully. And she's just like, shut up. Undy can get over it. She's like, please don't kill me. We have no idea what. She's like, shut up. Who do you take me for? And comes over, you know, raps and takes care of Dave Boy. And it's like, oh, then you have Alfred coming in with, like, a black mask on. And he's like, wait, what? Dave Boy? What the hell did you get yourself into? And Francis immediately recognizes Alfred's voice. Takes the, he takes the mask off and everything. And it's like, will he be okay? It's like, oh, you move him around, he might die. It's like, all right. And it's like, well, uh, what was it? Good night, ladies. Takes the shotgun, blast Julian like it was nothing. I was like, Jesus. I thought that was fascinating because I didn't expect him to do it. And half Julian's head is gone. Like it's like that was fucking gnarly dude it's like oh holy shit and francis is there covering in a little bit of his blood undine is too and francis is just standing there like huh uh alfred picks up day boy shoots one dude turns around so that day boy can shoot the other dude it's like let's get out of here so i was like that's what john wanted him to do that's what and then i was like wait what so why did john be okay with that so now it turns into a thing of like, okay, so when Inspector Aziz shows up, he believes that it was Francis behind all that. I mean, Francis can be violent when she needs to be, but I think she didn't want things to kind of turn out that way. But I guess I don't know whether she benefits from that or not. I think part of her is actually kind of surprised. It's like, oh, you were here to kind of like, why were you here, Alfred? Like, that's what you're trying to figure out. Maybe. I don't know. 
Because it's so interesting because there's a whole conversation about Alfred and, you know, Martha. They had that whole conversation where he was like, I'm done with violence. I can't. Which is interesting when you think about just everything later on. When you think, like, what Bruce does later on as Batman. He can be probably one of the most violent superheroes. Like, the way he kind of breaks bad guys. Literally bones and all that. And beats the crap out of them. But I guess the justification is there's a difference between violence and fighting for what's right and to protect people. Obviously, in this case, this was straight up violence. Uh, it was literally a hit, but you know, it's kind of, I, I thought I was, cause the moment he said that statement, I immediately thought of like, oh, you know, being, you know, the right hand to Batman, you know, and all that Bruce does is Batman. But then I'm like, oh, and it, it, I guess it was more so supposed to be kind of a statement about what he was going to potentially end up doing later on. Just a contrast between like, he's done with violence until that violence leads him to the person that took the people that he cares about. Let's not forget, it was a man and woman that entered. I mean, he even, because even um, Bats, I told him, it's like, oh, there's a long list of people that hate you. So, who could it be? Is it going to be someone we've met before, someone we haven't? Once again, they had a key to the place. So, the question then becomes, like, how did they get a key to the place? Because, once again, the person that was doing it strangled her. But then when we found her, she was she was on the floor and there was blood coming from her head. So, it's like, so, like, she must have fought back and the lady or whatever because Esme didn't know there was another person there ended up hitting her over the head. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to find... My assumption was just that it was, you know, the Raven Society coming, getting back at him. I thought it was that, but it seems like that's not the case. I would assume... Or not less Francis was behind it, but I feel like that wasn't the case. But we'll, we'll find out soon enough. What I thought was interesting, though, is, like, we had the Prime Minister and the Queen sitting down with a specter of Aziz and being like, wow... They didn't expect her to have the gumption to do that. They didn't expect that from Francis. And they're like, good on her. The fact of the matter is now the no-name league is a little weaker because now they've got his wife kind of being set up as the new leader. She kind of basically has to be voted in. But then it's like, oh, and then, you know, no-name league's on its way out. It's like, oh, we're going to have to remember this aspect about her, kind of be thankful for her doing this when we have her in irons. So I guess the whole point is that it's basically like a game to them to be like, basically... They don't have to do anything. They're basically letting the two groups destroy themselves. It's kind of like, oh, let them be their own undoing. And whoever's left standing will come in, sweep them under, like, sweep them off their legs, and then knock them, knock them, um, essentially what I mean by sweep them off their legs is, like, knock their feet from underneath them and basically watch everything topple. So they've got their own game in all of this, so... It's so interesting because it's like you, I mean, they have played their roles because obviously the whole Harwood torture situation, but kind of shows you, like they, like I said, they just seem like they're so background to this. Like, yeah, it's all happening, but it's like, eh, let, let the children play. Let them do whatever they want to. And when we come in, we'll spank them and put them, in their, put them back in their place, show them who's really in charge here. You know, I mean, maybe that's all they look at them as is like a bunch of rem built, uh, rambunctious, rebellious children or maybe that's all they they don't take them seriously maybe maybe not i don't know so that was interesting but then we get the twist at the end where it's like oh the reason why undine was kind of like oh i felt no because i thought someone was, i was like yeah she seemed like she just kind of got up and left i was actually surprised francis just let her leave but francis wasn't in her, she had no plans to go there and just kill anyone she just defended herself so i guess it's like well i think she probably had no plans to kill undine because she's not the actual leader of the no name group it's actually julian but then it turns to that whole thing of like, okay, so it turns out John and Undine are having an affair. It's like, oh, I thought by killing him, I'd feel empowered, free, you know, you know, something what I'm feeling. But it's like, no, you're still in shock. The fact of the matter is soon enough, London's going to be all yours. So I guess the whole point was she wanted the power for herself. She didn't love her husband anymore. She loved John, so it's like, oh, John, do this for me. So the whole thing was a planned hit. Obviously, Alfred doesn't know the full details, but no one ever does in this whole situation. So now what does that mean for Martha and Thomas when it comes to Alfred? Not only are they on opposite sides, but to be fair, this is a one-time thing. And once again, everyone's going to be under the impression that Francis did it. But I'm wondering when the information comes back, because Alfred probably doesn't know that that was the leader of the no-names. He probably doesn't know that. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I doubt John told him everything. He's just like, I want you to go in there, kill this person. Maybe he did tell him it just to be an added bonus. I mean, in fact, the matter is you're technically protecting Francis, so that can't quite sit right with him. But I don't, I don't know. I wonder what John did tell him. I, maybe we'll kind of get answers to that in the next episode because I'd be so interested in that. And then there's also the final thing of Alfred and Sandra 
shagging, which I'm not too surprised by. Uh, you know, whether that becomes something more later on, maybe. You know, Alfred's in a very, like, mixed up place. Obviously, everything with Esme kind of slowly piecing himself back together, doing what he did. Obviously, Sandra kind of has a thing for him, so that ends up happening. Whether something more happens because of that, I don't know. We'll see. But Alfred seems like not necessarily... Uh, he's like I said, he's in the process of still piecing himself together. I believe I don't think he's fully back together yet because I think there's still a lot he has to deal with. And once again, he's not going to be on his way to recovery until he kills a person. Pe well, not person, but people responsible for killing Esme. So we'll see. I'm actually surprised there's been no interaction with her father in the grand scheme of things. I'm, I mean, cause, well, because everyone's under the impression that it was a robbery that the, that this was all just you know it just fate or whatever. It's just kind of like um shit happens, but it's like no, it was planned. I'm curious to see whether that knowledge is going to affect Martha and Alfred's relationship going forward. Like, I mean, not like there really is one, but you get what I'm trying to say. Like, I don't know. Like I said, currently standing, they're kind of on opposite sides. But to be fair, Alfred kind of doesn't have a side in this whole thing. He's got his own side, and that's getting payback for what happened to Esme. So I'm very interested to see where the next episode takes us with all of this. And now moving on to this week's episode of Preacher. So much stuff went down in this episode, so let's break it down. Well, first and foremost, I like what we start off at the beginning of the episode where we basically kind of get the other side of that conversation. We only got like a tidbit of between us, Hairstar and Guy. And there's this whole thing about, you know, because obviously he want, it's like, you know, he's still upset about the whole Jesse thing. And God's just telling him, it's like, oh, yeah, you want to carve a vagina into him. That's so funny. It's also interesting because he's like, oh, touching on, you know, star and everything, calling him handsome and stuff. It's like, right. That's where that whole conversation where he asked, you know, Hoover too about like, oh, am I handsome and stuff like that. It's like, this is where that conversation stemmed from. But it's interesting because like everything is according to his plan, like everything everything has its part to play even talking about Humperdue which is interesting because God knows Humperdue's nickname and you know Hairstar has to be like no 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 that's such a charming name and whatnot because at first he's like where's Jesus and he's like oh well he's you know getting ready for the conference no 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 not him the other one and it's like talking about Humperdue and I just thought it's so interesting that he knows that nickname uh so it's but apparently he's so crucial to the plan the question is why does he know what Humperdue situation is it's kind of an idiot I'm wondering is that actually kind of the point is that basically he's trying to um bring in this new era he's trying to break forth like some well because that's the question like if you have Jesus what do you need Humperdue for I guess Humperdue's supposed to be the Jesus on earth it's like you're supposed to be the one that gathered people there it's like oh look at my child like here's my connection to the human world is that what role Jesus is supposed to play considering the fact that Jesus is here we see him in the episode and everything we'll get to that sooner it's actually kind of interesting because we've only seen him pop well I'm trying to think am I confusing this with something else was it this show or am I confusing it with American Gods it might be American Gods I'm confusing this with because I'm thinking of all the different Jesuses and I, 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 there was a scene with Jesus or whatever I was like no 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 that was um because we haven't seen Jesus for a while like the last time we saw him was in a flashback to him getting Mary pregnant essentially there's that whole situation but nevertheless I'm going on a huge tangent um regardless but, like, everything is a part of his plan. His plan even involves Jesse. Basically, he's like, oh, I'm going to take Jesse and I'm going to uh, carve a vagina into a soul, which you have hair being like, wait, his soul? Not his head? What? You know, so that turns into a whole thing of like, okay, so that kind of explains everything that God is doing. Like, he is putting Jesse through the ringer. The question is, is he trying to mess with Jesse enough to kind of break him in the sense of throw the balance in his soul off? Because, once again, like, that's why he couldn't use Genesis for bits of season two and a good chunk of season three was because his soul was imbalanced because it didn't match, obviously, Genesis. We know this whole thing. So I'm wondering, is he kind of trying to do a similar thing by throwing off the balance in Jesse's heart? Does it seem, I don't know, it's hard to say, but he's just putting him through these things i think it's the whole thing of trying to break jesse because it's like even with all this power no matter how much good you try to do everything kind of ends up fucking up around you because he tried to say that kid last episode kid ended up dying this episode he's on the plane that ends up crashing which we see that god's there kind of enjoying it like woo 
and then you know they're in his lifeboat and everything it's him and the pilot and I love that he also learns it. it's like after all of this this is when he learns Steve's name Steve is just kind of like oh my god we're gonna die and whatnot but then Jesse's like it's a miracle because we're actually still alive Hitler was wrong and he's like wait what he's like Hitler was wrong which that statement seems so out of context if you don't know the situation of my Jesse he does mean literally Hitler because he literally sat down and had a conversation with Hitler last episode it's it's funny when you think about the context of just the circumstances that we can have that conversation in this series to be like yeah Jesse was talking to Hitler who's now the new king of hell because he basically took over after Satan got killed by this supernatural killer saint of killers cowboy it's a whole thing you know I love that but nevertheless um, he ends up telling the guy to be more positive. The guy's like, yeah, yeah. And he ends up like helping Jesse dump the water out. They're like, no, we're going to live through this. And they end up getting most of the water out. Dude's legs get mad messed up. It's like, yeah, good thing you told me not to wear pants. He's being super positive. And Jesse is like, come on. Like, can you at least be quiet for us? Like, yeah, yeah, let's enjoy the silence. But he kept going on and on. He's like, stop being so positive. And he starts screaming. He's like, ah, ah, ah. And he's like, no more. Don't feel any more pain. And it's like, oh, after he's, he's like, whoa. That's cool because he recognizes what Jesse was doing to him. Sadly, that no pain thing led to a shark eating his hand because he didn't feel anything when the shark ate his hand. And, you know, I do like that aspect, too, because Jesse isn't a complete and utter asshole. He's like, no, 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 we're going to make it through this. The fact is, when we get to Australia, those beaches, we're going to drink a whole bunch of beers and we're going to get you fixed up. That's the plan, okay? It's like he's so concerned about the dude. It's like Jesse isn't like some complete – like he has shown tendencies to kind of be an asshole where he just kind of uses people and tosses them away. But, he no, it's like, no, because I think it's that whole struggle of like I'm, I'm, I can do good. I can be a good guy. I don't have to be a completely bad guy. So now it's a whole other, other circumstance. I'm going to keep this guy alive. We're going to do it. But the guy is under the impression, you know, for him, it's like, I've done a lot of bad. He's like, I've gotten married four times. Three of those times I got married for money. But he's like, I can change. I can do better. I'm going to do better. So save me. And Jesse's like, what? He's like, God save me. He's like, I'm not God. He's like, I've seen what you can do with your power. So save me. You promise you're going to save me. And Jesse tells him to live. It's interesting because Cassidy tried to tell uh, Jesse to do that last well season two with um Tua when she was dying like use Genesis obviously it wasn't working at that time but we can see even with Genesis Genesis can't do that it can do make you do things but it can't stop I guess the natural order of things I guess you couldn't use Genesis to be like don't be sick cancer go away it doesn't work like that Genesis isn't it's powerful but it's not omnipotent like massively like god level power kind of doing whatever you want to type of situation because obviously jesse was super pissed too because for him it's like the fact of the matter is he knows that this was all god's doing it's like the fact of the matter is because at first he tries to be like oh this is all a trial god's just trying to put us through the ringer you know and the guy's kind of see if it's like i don't know if i believe in god he's like i wouldn't blame you but believe in me and i think that's where he starts trailing into believing like oh jesse is god like oh you're you're kind of a god like being yourself with your powers and everything but jesse isn't he isn't he's just a man and maybe that's the point too to jesse's like oh you want to come look for me and try to interfere with my plan you want to act tougher than you are just because you have genesis doesn't matter if you have genesis you will never be me maybe the whole point is to show jesse what it is like to be god you want to know why i disappear the weight of the world like so many things i mean to be fair all this stuff is you setting an emotion or maybe you, the argument could be made later on it's like no 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 i'm not setting this all emotion it's just the, the craziness and randomness of the world that allowed the situation to happen i doubt it this is all a full-blown plan considering the fact that he was literally on the plane with jesse which once again i think that was him pretending to be tulip and cassidy just to mess with jesse's head maybe maybe not Makes you wonder. He probably he's probably the one that gave Jesse. I'm sure he's the one that set the mission in Jesse's mind in the first place about getting to the certain rock using Jesse's dad's voice as a means of transferring. It. It's it's got to all be him because it's all part of his plan to manipulate Jesse down this road and everything. So I think that's just fascinating itself. But like Jesse tells him, the, the, getting back to it, Jesse tells the, uh, pilot Steve to live, but it doesn't work. And he's like, I believed in you. You lied to me, and he dies. And for Jesse, it just, it sucks because it's like, no matter what, you know, once again, it's like, no matter what good he tries to do, it all ends up blowing up in his face. It's so interesting because the whole conversation obviously has always been like, Tulip O'Hare's can't do right one thing, you know, can't just do one thing right. And now it's kind of, Jesse's on that other shoe now where it just almost seems like he can do nothing right. Even when he tries to, it all kind of blows up in his face. He sends the, the pilot off to, um you know, floating in the water, wrapped up his body, put his hat on top of him. At one point while Jesse's talking, I was like, 
was that a shark fin I saw? And lo and behold, the dude's body gets ripped apart because we see blood in the water and his body turning and it's like, and Jesse just looks up. He's like, you're an asshole, especially even more so when he turns and looks. Oh, he's in Australia. And it's like, it's just like the biggest middle finger to Jesse. Like, it's the whole point of it all. It's so fascinating. So all the while that's happening, well, I'll go ahead and talk about it. I thought it was kind of interesting. Like, there, uh, Eugene and the cowboy in the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico, and it's like, oh, he's in Australia, so how, how are we going to do it? He blows into his gun. I was like, what the hell is he about to do? He shoots down. The bullet goes through, and bam. And he's like, whoa, did you literally dig your way to Australia? I thought that was scientifically impossible. So I guess, like, he shot his, like, he literally, I guess him and Eugene literally walked through the earth to get to Australia. Because part of me was, I was wondering, like, I guess when he blows fire into, when he blows his heated breath into it, either that's how he locks and loads the gun, which I don't think it is because he never did it before, but I guess that supercharges his bullet. Like, it adds, because the bullets have a natural, like, oomph, like, can punch a hole through anything type of thing, but I think when he adds the hell breath to it, it supercharges the bullet and makes it, like, I'm talking like cannon level power. Well, it's already cannon level powerful, so I guess like missile level powerful, I guess. But that's how him, him and Eugene get in Australia. And as they're walking by, we see the, the lifeboat that Jesse was on. So it's like they're literally not that far. But I was wondering, it's like, yeah, last time we checked, you were in Texas. Now you're going to go from Mexico. I was like, how the hell? I guess you're going to get on a boat. I was like, oh, that's going to be an interesting misadventure. We probably get a little tidbit of it. I was like, no, let's skip over that. Go straight through. I guess it makes sense. I guess in the grand scheme of the world and everything, I guess Mexico is like relatively on top of Australia. Like all you have to do is just bury like your way th down and you'll end up there. I guess that's it. I just didn't expect that to be the turn of events for that. So there's that. Then there's the other glorious side of this episode, your boy Cassidy. I love it when, like, Frankie ends up, oh, my God, there's an emissary coming. Like, oh, my God, it's Hitler. Now, oh, he's like, I should have gotten a photo or something. I'm like, I love that you're, I guess because he's kind of an evil doer himself, the fact is that he recognizes pure evil. It's like, come on. It's like, now that, that's true evil. Uh, and then he comes back around and Cassidy is alone. And he's like, what happened? And he's like, oh, I picked a lot with a, a um, Angel's Feather, and then I snapped both those guys' neck so before they could even scream. And he's like, yeah, you're trying to be funny. And he sees the bodies, and then your boy Cassidy goes in. Like, Cassidy's been in a few brawls over the course of the series, but he hasn't had many successful brawls. Like, the closest you can say is probably him and Jesse, but even then, it was like, it was like mates fighting. It was never like to the death. I mean, it seemed like it might be in certain occasions. Like, I guess the closest you can say is probably like in the um, the tombs in season three, but even then, it's like Jesse still whooped his ass. But to get Cassidy to have his good old like bam, 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 it's like yo, Cassidy's never outright whooped anybody's ass in a fight. This is his first time, and it's like yo, your boy Cassidy going in, winning, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yo. And he rips the dude's pants off. He's like, no, Frankie's like, no, not like this. And he does something like, what the hell is he doing? I don't know whether he reached for his foreskin, ripped his penis off, whatever the hell he did. But then he puts, I was like, and then he, he jumped, puts him down. I'm like, what the hell? And something pokes out of his head. I was like, what the hell did Cassidy do? Pull the camera back. He literally shoved the gun up his ass and then pushed him down on it. And now it's almost like he's sitting on the gun and it kind of pokes through his head. It's like, that is gnarly. Your boy Jet uh, Cassidy is vicious, but him getting all victorious, and then he makes it to the elevator, and there's like there's Tulip, and he's happy to see her, and she's happy to see him. But Featherstone's there. Uh, where's Tulip? Oh, uh, what Tulip? I met a Daisy, a few roses. The fact is, you have to tell me specifically what Daisy. And it's like you, I mean, what Tulip? It's like oh, you know which one I'm talking about. You know, she came here to save you. It's like why would she come and save me? And I love Tulip kind of being in the elevator, kind of rolling her eyes, like I don't know what well, you know why I'm here type of thing without saying anything. I thought that was kind of adorable. And it's like yeah, she is pretty stupid, isn't? It? That would be pretty stupid of her, wouldn't it, to kind of come and save me? So gets locked up again and everything. I also love that they like Featherstone's plan is like, oh, I know she'll come for Cassidy. So she's waiting in the cell across the hall from him and like her and a whole bunch of grail agents and then cut to later. And the guy's like, I got to go to the bathroom. He's like, I, I really got to go to the bathroom. Some guy's like, hush, shh. 
And he's like, if I knew we were going to be in here that long, Featherstone turns around and stabs one of the Grail guys and turns around. I was like, at first I was like, is that even the guy that was talking about going to the bathroom? And the guy's like, okay, I wet myself, so I'm good now. And she turns around, she goes, hush. I wonder, because it didn't seem like that was even the guy that was even telling him the shush. Maybe it was, but I love that that's her way of handling it. I was like, are you going to kill the guy that had to go to the bathroom? He's like, no, you didn't even kill the guy that had to go to the bathroom. I just love that. Featherstone is just that dedicated to her revenge. Um, I also love Cassie being so happy. It's like, oh, she came for me. He's like, all right. Who, who was it? Oh, Tulip. Oh, yeah. He even tells him later. It's like, oh, yeah, your girlfriend. You know, when's your girlfriend get? He's like, that's not my girlfriend. She's my mate's girl. He's like, oh, forbidden love. I love that. Angel. Also, like, he was like, can you shut up for a minute? He's like, okay. Was that long enough? How long was that? He was like. That was like six seconds. Really? He's like, it felt like forever. It's like, I love you. I love you, Angel, dude. I love you so much. Then you have like Cassidy ripping the flesh off his hands as he climbs up the cell to try and get up to the Angel dude and kills him. Because he was like, I'm going to get up there and kill you. The moment he said that, I was like, all right. So he, they can do the whole come, he can do the whole coming back thing like DeBlanc and Fiore did in season one. Well, Fiore kind of did it a little bit more in season two, kind of made a, a spectacle of it. So there's that. I even love the dude walking back in the cell and everything. He's like, you literally could have just cut me free. You could have just got me free. You didn't have to go through the trouble of killing me. He grabs Cassidy and they fly out of there. I'm like, oh my God, Cassidy and an angel buddy. That's going to be quite the duo to look out for. What I think is so fascinating too, it's like, Cassidy seems like he ends up befriending angels the most because he ended up befriending uh, Fiore in season two. So, you know, for that one episode before, you know, everything went out with Fiore. So I just thought that was kind of, interesting in itself so there's that uh there's tulip being brought by uh hoover too to go see jesus and be his valet and as i because he's like oh here's an emissary because the emissary we saw earlier was hitler I was like, oh my god she's gonna run into hitler because let's not forget her and hitler know each other because they were on the bus near the end of season three together like when they were being taken to hell by the cowboy and um uh sydney the angel of death along with you know uh, Eugene, I thought that was, I thought that was like, oh my god, it's like, I thought that was what was going to happen, but it's like, nope, the emissary turned out to be Jesus himself, and she's actually lying to him and stuff like that, she actually apologizes later on because she kind of felt bad about, because I thought it was interesting because hair is right there in front of her, I'm like, wait, hair didn't recognize her? I was like, well, to be fair, he met Tulip one time face to face, you would assume he had files on them, I would assume so, I mean, but to be fair, maybe all the files that were there, Hoover and Featherstone had, but maybe he never did. But I thought that was fascinating because I was about to say, no, 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 like you, you've met her before. Well, let's not forget, she literally is the reason why you have a penis head. It's because she fired that shot that gave you the penis head. So I thought that was it. But uh, and then he, as he was about to leave, he's like, "Do I know you? You look so familiar." So I was like, "Okay." I wonder, did he ever look at Tulip? So I'm sure her. I was like, "Oh, the whole blonde wig thing is kind of doing good," but he was starting to see through it. But you know, Jesus wanted to see, you know, his descendant, Hump Humperdoo. And it's like, oh, I hear he's quite a dancer. It's like, yeah, we'll get on that. And, you know, I love him trying to help out, you know, because he's like, no, 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 I, you know, Jesus, it's fine that you want to help and everything, but things are going to get bloody. Things might even get a little dangerous, might get a little problematic, you know, when it comes to me trying to save my friend. And I don't think you can really help. He's like, oh, really? And he goes down there. What's it's so interesting that like even Featherstone won't let Jesus do whatever he wants to. She put her hand on him and was like, yeah, you're not going down there, which is kind of interesting that you would even do that considering the fact that you're talking to Jesus Christ, but whatever. So, but the fact is he's also the one who just walked away. He was like, yeah, it didn't work. I'm like, it didn't seem like he put up much of a fight when she just put her hand on you. It, okay. But Tulip goes down there, and um, Jesus kind of convinces her not to kind of go down th the route she did, was going to. So it's like, hey, oh, end up finding out that Cassidy got away. And it's like, hey, so what are you going to do? It's like, well, I'm going to find Cassidy, and then I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to. Because for so long, Tulip's kind of been going along with whatever Jesse was doing a part of the whole search for God. Uh, season one, well, at the end of season one, well, because she went to get Jesse in season one. Go, let's let's get back together. Let's get the band back together. Let's go get our revenge. Season two, she went with him to search for God. Season three, helping him get away from his grandma. Then we could go and do whatever we want to. Then obviously we got to go save Cassie. But then we can go do whatever we want to. She's always kind of going with the flow of the motion with Ka what Jesse wanted. So it's like, nah, he's not here anymore. So fine, screw him. I'm gonna do whatever the hell I want. You know, 
after she finds gas, which we had Jesus being like, can I come along? I'm like, yo, now we're getting another crazy duo where we got Jesus and Tulip kicking it together, which is so interesting considering like where God and Tulip stand, like he was using and manipulating her as part of his grand design and everything. So it's like, oh, that's interesting. Which is also going to be interesting if Jesus isn't there when it comes to this whole emissary thing. Which, speaking of the emissary thing, like, for one, it's like, okay, you know, Jesus is asking about Humperdue, so, you know, it's like, right, they still haven't found the real Humperdue, so they're going to use a clone, they're still trying to prepare him to be a dancer, just in case the time comes. Now, what I thought was interesting is that Hitler ends up sneaking in, and he's playing the music because he wants to see what they're really hiding, and he's like, oh, you're quite the dancer, and he's about ready to play the piano. Which the moment Humperdue doesn't, the clone doesn't dance, which maybe it will. I feel like from the trailer, I feel like I remember it dancing when Hitler was playing the music, but I could be wrong. It's been a little while since I saw the trailer, so I might be missing her memory. But if they haven't taught him how to dance yet, that might be the key sign of like, oh, this isn't a real Humperdue, and Hitler might know that and what that means. I also love that it was like a little conference because Jesus was going to be across the table from Hitler and everything, which is like... I mean, this is all part of the grand plan and everything like that, but it's so crazy that it's like, oh, it's almost like a business meeting, which I guess like heaven and hell is to a certain extent kind of like a meeting, which a business within their own right. So that's crazy. I even love Hoover too giving uh, Hair Star like a pep st pep talk because it's like you know Hair is like you know he's he's like sir I know you're kind of basically I know you're a little down and dumps but the fact is you have so much to be proud of you're the all father the fact of the matter is the world is at the tip of your fingers basically um, you're sitting pretty so that was kind of enough it's like oh that seemed like some stuff that like Hoover one would say you know so that's uh, you see some semblances of Hoover there I think while also being himself because he's very stoic and he's like I said he seems like a combination of certain aspects of Hoover but he seems a lot more like Featherstone but even less goofy than Featherstone because Featherstone she tries to be serious because obviously she had the whole dynamic with her and Hoover being the goofy one but it seems like she's just she tries to be the perfect agent, but she's not. She's very flawed. Whereas Hoover, too, seems like he's not as flawed, but he makes mistakes, too, because he didn't recognize Tulip's here. But who would know? Because Tulip's insignificant to everyone else except for Featherstone, because her and Tulip go back and they have such bad blood, which is so crazy to think at one point in time they were pretend friends. That's a whole thing, like I said. But nevertheless, I love that he's like, yeah, sitting pretty, and literally the his foreskin ear falls off and lit, and it's just like when he's pillowing it up I'm like that's so disgusting and gross but of course it would land on Jesse's picture and it's like part of him is probably like no 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 I God's got his plan but it's like obviously it's not sitting well with him because he wants to kill Jesse because let's not forget him missing an ear is also because of Jesse not directly it was more so the um that particular grail agent under Jesse's control but still you know so I'm so so very excited to see where all this ends up taking us. Like I said, these these uh, duos, because like I said, we got the cowboy and Eugene closing in on Jesse, who's sadly alone now. Well, technically not alone, because I'm sure God's there along the way, you know. I mean, because who knows? Maybe God isn't even watching. And maybe God's like, ah, eh, leave him to his own devices. I, I like to let him squirm. Like, everything's already planned out. It's all going according to plan. So I don't need to be watching it. To be fair, he was there during a plane crash. But maybe it's like, oh, I'm here. So maybe he is an invisible force that he is there the entire time. But we're just not seeing him, regardless. Uh, so there's that situation. And then on top of all of that, you know, like I said, uh, potentially Tulip and Jesus and Cassidy and the Angel. I am so excited to see where all this takes us, especially, especially, especially now that Jesse's in Australia and seeing where this all ends up taking them. It's, oh, dude, I cannot wait. But really, that's all I want to talk about. So the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love, light to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.